Hey folks, this is Byron Herbalist. We are back in the Herb Lab and today I wanted to talk about one of the most important new functional tests that I've been using uh, very, very frequently. And I have been considering using it as a baseline lab for every patient that I see. Now, I know that functional lab testing isn't free and not everyone can afford it, so I haven't gotten that firm with my recommendations, but the organic acids test, particularly by Great Plains Labs, which we'll talk about today, has just been a practice changer for me. It is so, so helpful if you're dealing with chronic health issues, particularly if you don't know why. If there's still a question around your diagnosis, and you haven't got a clear cut explanation for why you're experiencing these symptoms, I would highly, highly, highly recommend this test just to dive in a little bit deeper on how biochemistry might have become a little bit dysregulated and also the big question, why? So I will frequently run this test if someone is dealing with digestive issues that can't be explained from you know, a more standard stool test. You know, even these stool tests that cost a decent amount of money, they don't always explain why someone's digestion is compromised. Uh, pain is a really, really big indicator to run this test. Fatigue, huge, huge, huge. Um, there's a lot of these kind of, um, you know, fatigues that come on after meals, symptoms get flared with, uh, with food triggers, and also patients that are extremely sensitive, whether they're sensitive to their environment, whether they're sensitive to food, whether they're as sensitive to smells or to touch or to sound, those kind of highly sensitive patients, um, the organic acids test has been an absolute game changer for the majority of them. So what I was thinking we could do just to really hammer this home was to look at a particular patient of mine's oat test. Now this patient has been dealing with Lyme for quite some time. She has made great, great, great progress. She is definitely out of the woods on the Lyme front. I think, you know, from retesting, we, we'd find that she's clear of the, uh, the microbe, the infectious microbes, those stealth pathogens. Um, but she's still dealing with pain. She's still dealing with fatigue. She's still dealing with, um, you know, some digestive issues as well. She has been tested up and down. We've got gene testings. We've got really advanced stool tests. We've got, um, you know, the Lyme test. We've got uh, pretty advanced blood tests. You know, definitely, um, you know, hasn't skimped on the, uh, the lab bill. And um, most of her labs throughout the course of her illness have been incredibly dysregulated. So we're still kind of wondering what's driving symptoms at the moment. I said, look, let's just do an oat test. I would have done an oat test as a baseline if I had been there uh, initially for, for her treatment. Um, and we ran it and we saw, we saw some really uh, significant markers that uh, helped to describe a lot of her symptoms. So let's jump into it. So here we go. This is the first page of the Great Plains lab uh, oat test. They call it the moat section. So all around microbes and infections and overgrowth imbalances on that kind of microbial front. And here we can see a really clear mold exposure. A lot of the furans are elevated and they're signifying an aspergillus or a green mold generally colonizing the uh, digestive tract, although she could have been exposed to mold in her food that is in her digestive tract. I would say from the rest of the markers with this oat test that this is actually growing in her digestive tract. And really, that's, that's the kind of big headline with the oat test. We don't ever hang our hat on one marker and we look for this pattern of dysfunction and we start to kind of, you know, chalk up the different offenses. When we get to the bottom of this one, it's all fungal. It's all the fungal kingdom that's driving all of this dysfunction. And uh, yeah, again, we're gonna pick out some of the, um, you know, significant uh, implications of that as, as we get into it. Um, so Arabinose, this one is uh, more of an indicator of the hyphal form of Candida. 
tax the cell wall. I wouldn't um, be surprised if she was dealing with uh, food intolerances and uh, you know sensitivity. Um, not extreme. I mean, I do see this one elevated. This one's there. It's definitely popping. It's definitely significant. But um, you know, we we want to see it quite elevated to be associated with significant symptoms for sure. I'm um, got a little fusarium marker again. That's commonly from uh, food, although she is eating a pretty pristine diet. So again, that fusarium could be growing in her digestive tract. Moving on to the bacterial markers, you know, again, these are all kind of high normal. There's nothing too significant here. And again, we do have the stool test to kind of back up or confirm or to give more info. That's, that's always helpful. A um, little bit of a split between 12 and 13 could be a bit of a glycine deficiency. And again, I think a lot of our glycine is getting chewed up trying to detoxify this uh, marker number four, furan 25 dicarb box silic acid. Um, it takes glycine right here to uh, kind of conjugate and detox it. We can see a high number four and a you know, normal five, uh, you know, definitely not an elevated five. Again, might be chewing up a lot of our glycine to kind of uh, eliminate the mold. And right there, that's a great example. Mold is putting load, more load, on her phase two glycine conjugation. And, uh, and then that glycine can't go to detox all of these other things that it's supposed to detoxify. And you wind up with system failure, basically. That's what we're dealing with. Um, one of the bacterial markers right here for uh, creosol, it is a marker of uh, C. diff. Um, used to be known as Clostridium difficile. Um, it's been renamed recently to Clostridioides difficile. Um, you know, that's a mild elevation. I think if we did stool testing, you know, which we have, we would find that it wasn't, um, you know, uh, a Clostridium uh, toxin secreting. Yeah, here we go right here. So that's negative. Her symptoms don't line up with a C. diff kind of overgrowth. I think this is definitely a consequence of mold growing in the body, uh, suppressing her immune system, and also a consequence of long-term antibiotic exposure to treat the Lyme. You know, she's been on round after round of antibiotics, strong herbal antimicrobials. You know, her gut's definitely taken a, a, a good beating there. Um, here we go. This is significant. So oxalic acid in the urine, um, that is pretty darn significant. It's definitely on the, um, you know, more dysregulated side. Um, 19 and 20, they uh, represent enzymes that help to break down oxalic acid. You can see that number 20 is trending a bit high normal. So, you know, definitely again, like we mentioned, enzymes are under load. The body's under more load and it's struggling to keep up. Um, this is pretty significant. And, you know, you might limit oxalates in the diet. That might make you help. Uh, you might make you feel better. You know, joint pain, muscle fatigue, generalized fatigue, mitochondrial dysfunction, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of dysregulation with um, oxalate overload. But I would attribute that to the green mold exposure. That's a, that's a strong, strong link. I would say this is the root cause of the, uh, of the oxalate overload um, and not so much the diet. Um, her ability to turn glucose into energy is looking pretty good up until it hits succinic acid. This is one of the uh, complexes in the, um, in the mitochondria and the uh, Krebs cycle. Um, you know, it's a little bit kind of high, not overly concerning, and I don't generally find that treating the mitochondria helps people get better when there's something putting load on the mitochondria. So treat the root cause you know, support symptoms, that's important. If she's struggling to sleep or if she's struggling with energy, um, you know, we, we definitely want to make her feel better while we're uh, getting to the root cause, that's important. Um, again, number 30 to 32, you know, trending high, high normal, they are, uh, again, indicators of mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, neurotransmitter metabolites, so these are all looking good, surprisingly. I was expecting to see more dysregulation here. Thankfully, we don't have to deal with, um, you know, tryptophan getting stolen to create this kind of neural uh, inflammatory uh, organic acid, quinolinic acid. Um, generally, that's a marker of inflammation, uh, stealth pathogens like Lyme. So 
again, this is reassuring. I'm, I'm happy to see that neurotransmitters in the nervous system aren't completely dysregulated. They're actually quite balanced. Very good to see. Um, number 41, trending high, you know, just before that cutoff, 9.7, that's a marker of a folate deficiency, so uh, B9 is the big one there, and her ability to turn fats into energy and to kind of generate, I mean, she's not in um, ketosis here uh, at the moment, and, you know, high normal, but definitely not something we would want to spend too much time on at the moment. Um, not the biggest issue. Um, nutritional markers, some of these are very robust, accurate markers, others are always low. So again, I wouldn't put too much kind of um, you know, emphasis on that, but I would consider other parts of her kind of biochemical pathways where B6 is required and it might be getting chewed up. And the most obvious one right there would be the enzymes that work to degrade and break down oxalates. They, they both run on um, B6. Um, so vitamin B12, this is a very, very accurate marker of B12, uh, particularly for kind of energy, um, adenosylcobalamin. And this little asterisk means that as this marker gets elevated, it's a sign of deficiency. So don't get confused thinking that she might have too much, you know, or trending towards too much B12. This is a marker of trending away from, you know, kind of average and more towards deficiency. Again, for her, not a concern. She's got, she's got ample B12 there. And we've got serum B12, and we've got holotranscobalamin uh, markers showing that uh, her B12 is good. Although we do have gene testing showing that her uh, ability to kind of handle and recycle B12 in the methylation cycle um, is a bit compromised. So this is where functional testing, which is what's happening right now, and gene testing, which doesn't really change, um, doesn't always line up. Um, I would always, um, you know, take a, a preference of functional testing, what's actually happening in the body right now, rather than what could happen or what you're kind of predisposed to. Um, not to say that gene testing is invaluable. It's very valuable. Um, so on that note, talking about frank deficiencies and, uh, you know, not, not enough kind of, um, you know, vitamins in the tank, vitamin B2, riboflavin, again, that little asterisk, it's trending high. That is an indicator of a deficiency. She does not have enough riboflavin. And this is very common in fungal and mold exposure. And I really have to thank Elisma Lambert for that. She has just been so, so crucial in my understanding of uh, oat testing. And uh, she's a very valuable resource. Um, so on this front right here, let's look to kind of tie things together. We're always looking to kind of make, make things kind of fit the patient. She has a uh, MTHFR SNP, so she's heterozygous. So, you know, uh, methylation might be a bit on the back foot. And B2 is the cofactor, flavin adenine dinucleotide, FAD, is the cofactor for the MTHFR gene. What does that mean? It means it needs B2 to work, right? and uh, she does not have B2 because of the mold. So if you take this huge step back and you look at this patient and what's happening for her, mold and genes are putting the brakes on her methylation um, pathway through a bunch of different um, mechanisms. B2 is definitely significant. She has been supplementing with B2 since she has, um, since we've you know, got this test and, and worked together and uh, she's making progress, which is great. Already made heats of progress. You know, this doesn't kind of explain everything. She's, she's kind of laid the foundation. She's worked through the Lyme and this B2 and a few other uh, recommendations, this, this next level of healing, which is really exciting. Um, quick movement too, you know, within a month or two, we're seeing progress. Um, with chronic disease, a month or two, seeing progress is uh, definitely uh, exciting news. Um, high NAC, don't really know what to make of that. Uh, she was supplementing NAC, so that could be that simple. Um, and also, um, you know, the conversion of cysteine down to glutathione is definitely compromised with mold and mycotoxins. 
uh, the enzyme that converts uh, down through that pathway gets inhibited by mold and mycotoxins. So you're getting this pile up of NAC, maybe it's going towards kind of oxidative stress, maybe it's going down towards bile or towards, uh, you know, kind of uh, sulfate uh, support and, uh, you know, the kind of PAPS enzymes. That's, uh, you know, a conversation for another day. Let's keep it simple. <laughs> it's not her problem. Um, you know, even though she does have high NAC, we just we stop supplementing and I see there um, so right here indicators of detox this is such 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 a valuable piece of the puzzle and I have seen significantly unwell patients only have one of these markers out of balance everything else was fine which is a shock to me but definitely something that um, we want to address in this particular patient uh, she has a high, you know, pyroglutamic acid, not frankly elevated, but definitely kind of out of my comfort zone. And this little asterisk right here is indicating a deficiency. And that is the kind of glutathione recycling, because the glutathione goes in this little kind of cycle from oxidized to reduced and back again. It kind of um, flips through. Uh, burning up some of the cofactors while it does it. Nothing's free. Everything kind of takes, uh, takes something in the tank. Um, so again, we're seeing a deficiency of glutathione. Um, and then 59, this is basically the body saying we need to detoxify. We're, 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 um, we're putting a preference on detoxification. So 59, again, high normal. I was pretty kind of surprised. I was expecting to see more. And this might be because she was supplementing with NAC and some of it was getting into glutath glutathione production or maybe because she's done all this great work at uh, eliminating this, these stealth pathogens that she was dealing dealing with for, uh, you know, close on a decade. Um, ammonia excess, you know, salicylate issues, they're all looking good, and the amino acid metabolites are all looking good. I mean, ideally, you want them all stacked up on the left there, so I will not bore you with any of the uh, other details. Um, just to give you an executive summary here, we are dealing with mold that's knocking on to a uh, immune kind of suppression, you know, C. diff, whether that's a consequence of the antibiotics very significant oxalate overload. I mean, this could just be driving pain, fatigue, muscle fatigue, joint pain, you know, lots of issues there. Um, and then moving down, uh, you know, uh, nutrient deficiencies and definitely on the back foot in terms of glutathione production and the ability to detoxify. So that is a snapshot at how valuable oat testing can be. Again, this patient has made miles of progress before we started working together, and this is just the next step. I would have been so curious how it looked, you know, five years ago when things were really, um, were really rough for her. But uh, you know, it just shows there are some things you know, as an experienced clinician that I can kind of make an educated guess on. Um, there's some things that I could treat without seeing results. Um, is the lab test going to change my recommendations? With an organic acid test, it always does. She could have had high ammonia. I'm surprised she didn't, right? And maybe that means that her citrulline and her arginine and that whole kind of ammonia detox pathway is working perfectly. Um, or maybe she doesn't have, uh, you know, one of these microbes that produces an excessive amount of ammonia. But these chronic health patients, complex, uh, unexplained, these mystery illnesses, is it Lyme? Is it mold? Is it heavy metals? You know, is it nutrient deficiencies? You know, what is happening here? Is it genetics? All of these things, you get a really good kind of feel for which way the biochemistry is being kind of pushed with the organic acids test. Highly recommend it. I have shopped around a little bit. I've looked at different options and I am firmly in the camp of Great Plains at the moment. It takes time. Uh, it's a little bit expensive. I think it runs about 350 uh, Australian dollars. 100% worth the investment. 
uh, in time and money for anyone that's dealing with uh, chronic health issues. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, leave a comment below. If you want to see more case studies, I've got just uh, ample, ample <laughs> you know, case studies to choose from. Um, we're going to be covering some methane SIBO cases, some kind of good success. Um, you know, some inflammatory bowel disease cases, loads of oat testing because it's just, uh, you know, a big, big part of my practice at the moment. Um, yes, yeah, so like the video and leave a comment. Love to hear from you and I will see you in the next video.